Theodora asked me to be her interlocutor tonight, and I was pretty happy about that because, as she said, I have seen pretty much everything that she's done in New York. Franklin Furness presented her work in 1977 when she was performing in it herself. And uh, so I thought I would start the discussion with a question that we all need to know in order to understand this artist and how she works. And that is, when exactly did you get the bug? Did you find out that you were an artist and did you realize that this was what you had to do? Um, I was always making things as a child and especially sewing things and um, making a lot of things to wear and a lot of body coverings. And um, Let's I back guess, up and tell, tell everybody where you were raised. Uh, and. So and, uh, I was in San Francisco, mm -hmm. and um, I grew up in a pretty strict household where we, uh, my sister and I, weren't um, allowed to go out much, and we could only really socialize with other Greek kids and Greek families. And um, one thing was my um, sister got her driver's license, and I, uh, we were in high school, and. Um, so we, were, we could go out on Sunday afternoons with the car. And we were near Golden Gate Park, about 10 minutes from Golden Gate Park. And so um, I was always making things yeah. like costumes out of 2,200 walnut shells or um, animal bones or feathers or um, baby bottle nipples, just entire constructions. And then I would also use acrylic paint and paint my face and my my arms and parts of my body. And um, so I would leave with the props in the back seat of the car. And then I would put paint on in the car as my sister was driving me to the park. And then um, I put the costumes on, and she was instructed to keep the motor running in case the performance was really bad. So we would drive along and look for a place where there were people sitting or standing or something. And she'd go a few feet ahead and keep the motor running. And I would come out, and I would do these short performances. They never had words to them. They were always some kind of movement. Sometimes they had a message, like I would make a sign. They'd have a political message, um, support the great boycott or whatever. And um, <laughs> there were a lot of times when the performance was lasting about 90 seconds. And I knew it was like not working. And then I would run into the car, and uh, there would be like, I don't know, I would use olive oil or something to get all the paint off and get changed back in. And then by the time we got back to my house, no one ever, ever knew what we had done. So I, I must have done that about 25 times when I was in high school. So I think that was my artwork at the time. So. Um, we have a clandestine, a stealth <laughs> performance artist here. Um, so then, uh, what, what came, is this for Theodore? Sure. OK. Um, or should we share this? Or? No, I have, I have a mic in my pocket. Oh, my mic must you. not be working, yeah. What, uh, did, you, uh, did you identify as an artist yet? Or did, what? what can you explain your motivation for doing performance for unwitting audiences in the park? It had to do with some sort of message, and it also had to do with, I, I don't think I understood it at the time, but I think a lot of us who became performance artists later um, knew that our body was a vehicle for the message somehow, or, or for an impression, or so, something like that. So. Um, I was always making things that were sort of body scale, and they were for the body. They were to be worn. And they were, um, I guess, kind of communication, direct communication. So then um, I did go um, to Berkeley as an undergrad. And I, that was kind of a perfect moment, because there were suddenly many public events and a lot of action in the streets and a lot of performances. So that. Um, by then, I certainly knew that I was, I was making things. So I was a sculptor I was studying. And, um, but I knew that I was wanting to perform a lot and perform outside in encountering the public. What, what was your major? 
what was what were you doing in what did you call yourself in school? I was Sculpt an art student. Sculpture? But I, okay. but I also did theater, too. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, then what happened? You well, got to New I York? Then I to New York to okay. go to graduate school because I thought I would study stage design. And immediately I, I understood that the streets in New York were very different than the streets in, say, Berkeley or Oakland or even San Francisco. And so I kind of went indoors. It didn't feel comfortable to just do mm. these kind of casually conceived sort of run-ons into the street. So it, it actually took me indoors. Mm. But fortunately, at that very same time, um, a movement was rising which in Soho, in downtown Manhattan, which was another wave of performance art, or the, one of the most recent waves of performance art. So that was also a perfect sort of situation for me and for a lot of artists, I think, like you. <laughs> so in, in the early days of Franklin Furtis, we asked... Maybe it came back and get... Sorry, a little recording okay. part of it. Franklin Furness was located in Tribeca for 20 years on Franklin Street between West Broadway and Church. And artists used the inside, the outside, the backyard, the ceiling, the floor. They used pretty much the whole place as their uh, organ of expression. Uh, Ann Messner, for example, did a performance which involved amplifying the keys of a typewriter to the streets so of the people who were going to the courthouse down Franklin Street would hear this clacking noise as they went by. Uh, could you describe the first piece that I ever saw you do at Franklin Furtis? Well, you have to understand that um, it was such a wonderful time then because you could have an idea for a performance, and so many of the performances at that time were really, really short. I mean, I think they were 20 minutes or less. But you could actually have a performance idea, and you could go to Martha Wilson, who had this space, and you would say, um, I think I have a piece that's maybe 15 to 20 minutes long. Could I do it in two weeks? And she would go, yeah. So <laughs> you, would, you would actually get such a great chance to try out your work. Um, so uh, one of the first pieces I did, I did at Martha's Space. I did at Franklin Furness, mm -hmm. and I think it was about 20 minutes long. Mm -hmm. And it was autobiographical, and it was called The Venus Cafe, which is the name of my father's luncheonette in San Francisco. And, um, and then I went on to do it again and again and to expand it, but that was certainly its first appearance. Yeah. Um, I was disappointed, shocked, and unhappy when Theodora transitioned out of performance art and into theater, uh, in my opinion, uh, theater and performance art are mutually opposed in that uh, the goal of theater is to convince you that it's not Monday, that it's not freezing cold outside, but instead we're in France and it's the revolution, we're on the barricades. You, you, you're transported out of your regular life and into some other life. But the job of performance artists is to remind you that it's Monday. We're here in an academic situation uh, discussing the history of theater and the history of performance art. Uh, generally speaking, performance artists never let you forget that it's <laughs> happening now in real time. Uh, Laurie Anderson then screwed around with um, mixing theater and performance art together. And um, right now, Franklin Furness gave a grant to an artist, Julie Atlas Muse, who's performing at Abrams Art Center. And what she has done is she's stepped in and out of the frame throughout the whole performance. So you, so you see her, she comes out as herself, and then she becomes Beauty of Beauty and the Beast, and her partner becomes the Beast in Beauty and the Beast. And then they go back to themselves, and then back to Beauty and the Beast, so they're, they're, they're messing and playing with both traditions and mingling them together. Um, so 
explain to me, please, <laughs> justify to me, please, uh, why you decided to transition out of performance art and into being a director? Yeah. I think that um, I made several pieces that were autobiographical, and I think that I felt at that time that I had to be the performer in these pieces because they were about the story of my life. But I was always making objects that I performed with. So as I got tired of autobiography and I wanted to talk about other things and bigger things than just myself, um, I started using more and more objects, and eventually I came onto what I was making, which were uh, performing objects and, yes, puppet figures. Um, and somehow, as I left my own life and got interested in other kinds of real life, like other kinds of documentary material, um, I also stepped away and I preferred to be the director and to sort of frame the event. And for me, I don't see such, a, such an oppositional tug between certain kinds of performance art and theater. Um, but certainly, I became more of a director. I relied on the performing talents of many other people. And um, always the making of um, the making of the objects, the performing objects. But for me, it's not as hard, um, hard a divide between mm -hmm. performance mm -hmm. art and, and theater. Well, and to give credit where credit's due, uh, Theodora started to tell histories, the history of right. um, electricity, the invention of electricity, the history medicine. of medicine, yeah. uh, the history women of medicine, in yeah. women in prison, right. had, um, as I believe, it had an Ebola virus that you had made out of fiberglass that was about right. yay big. Right. Uh, and then uh, the scale of puppets, who, one of whom had a leg amputated, was about yay big. And then there was also a person who was suffering from AIDS who was a full-size person encased in a plastic bag. So it used wildly different forms of scale uh, in the course of telling the story. So. Just say a few more words about the storytelling part of your... I, it, I always love... Um, I, I think I never worked with a play until about 10 years ago. I think up till then, I, I consider myself a collage artist that collages together pieces of text the way you would almost stitch together a piece of, of work. 2,200 walnut shells. <laughs> and... Um, so um, I think that's what I was always doing, but I was always attracted to real material. For example, the material tonight are either um, speeches um, where there was actual, you know, someone asking or, or begging to, to be listened to and to be convinced of something. And, and then there are some that are more reflective, like the little UNESCO one. But um, I always like taking words that were actually there, yeah. Who, uh, along the way, in the course of your career, has influenced you profoundly? I think in the early days of performance art, there were people like Carolee Schneemann, and certainly people like Vito Acconci, certainly people like Laurie Anderson. And then um, I did work early on with Richard Schechner before it became the, the Worcester Group. Um, the performance group, and certainly Richard Foreman. I mean, there were those two communities, the art world and the theater world, lived in the same neighborhoods, and at times they really did not commingle. Some did socially, but some didn't at all. But I, I, <laughs> I, I had really a foot in each world, I think. And did you as well? Yeah. Yeah, we would go to see Richard Foreman and, yeah. and go to see Laurie Anderson also. Um, now, I think I have asked my burning questions, <laughs> and I want to know if anybody else has yeah. any burning questions yeah. that they wish to ask Theodora. <laughs> yeah. I would like to know where you thought about the collaboration with uh, Judith in this work. Oh, yeah. Um, well, there's actually a, a wonderful part about UNESCO that we're working on that we didn't get to yet. And so I had asked her, 
I said, would you like to write a few words when we introduce the UNESCO chair? And she wrote this very funny thing where she said, oh, welcome, it's Mr. UNESCO. Um, you, uh, I've always thought that a poet and a playwright should not only be witty, but wise. And you're getting there, Mr. UNESCO. You're pretty witty. <laughs> but she has mixed feelings about UNESCO, and, and she's so, she had a wonderful way of expressing it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have a question. Um, what is a puppet in your definition? And um, is there a slight difference between what you might define as a puppet and what you might also define as a performance piece? Okay. Um, Kathy Shaw? Yeah. Where are you? I, I would love Kathy Shaw to answer this because she thinks long and hard about things that perform, and I just would be curious to hear how she would answer it. Hi. I would say that anything can be a puppet, actually. It's um, the intentional way that you handle the object that turns an object like a spoon that you're using to feed yourself into a spoon that's suddenly a, a, a character or a creature or a, an object that has some sort of intention. That's my answer. And we also have a really great artist with us tonight, too, Hannah Tierney. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if Hannah feels like saying what she thinks a performing object or a puppet is. can really make a gesture and let the gesture become a symbol that we all understand is really falls into this category. They did a much better job. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question to Mrs. Wilson. How and where from you got this idea that performers supposed to be connected only to here and now? Any form of art, every piece of art, based first of all of imagination. And what performers can you, take you whenever you wish, millenniums back and millenniums ahead, one place and another place. I cannot see any difference. So you're agreeing with her? That's okay. Yeah, perfect. You said it's a performance that's here now, only here. What? Why? Can you hear Oh, oh, that, uh, yeah, I think that's, uh, we, what I was, um, I can't hear you. what I was hoping to question? describe, well, the, what is the you. question? Okay. I disagree that performance. Oh, you disagree that, that ah, yeah, 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 okay. But Judith also said something about, are you addressing Judith or Martha? <laughs> Martha. Martha, okay. Okay. Not for you, ah. sorry. Per performance art is descended from a visual art tradition, and I believe, and there's no agreement as to where the first performance art work took place. Uh, for example, Rosalie Goldberg in her book makes Ubu Roy the first performance artwork, but that is a work of theater, in my opinion. I believe the first performance artwork was when the Italian futurists printed 800,000 copies of their manifesto called Against Passeist Venice, and then went up the clock tower and waited for people to come out of church. This is in 1910. And when the faithful were coming out of church, they started throwing their manifesto off the clock tower into the Piazza San Marco, and the people picked it up and read that, oh, Venice is passe and should be allowed to float into the Adriatic Sea and sink. So they became angry, and they ran up the clock tower, and the poets and painters ran down the clock tower, and they had a fist fight in the, in the, uh, the stairwell. So I take that moment of physical confrontation as the beginning of performance art, because performance art is often the embodiment of an idea, usually with the body of the artist, often a confrontational idea, an idea that is maybe not so acceptable to regular people. I 
I was just going to say that um, I know it's something that Theodora, you and I have talked about um, uh, over the last year or so. This whole question now of what is performance art and what is theater, it's actually been going on since the late 70s very much in terms of um, you know, the criticism and critical writing. But since Judith's here, I just want to say that every time I do some research on um, performance, it's interesting that the living theater um, in its own space and in its um, relationships with artists had many visual artists and dancers right. and uh, in the same venue. And then and that was in like in the late 50s and 60s. Um, and you know, many of the happenings and concerts and all kinds of things by people that we identify with the visual arts world became more separate, the worlds in the 70s, but then periodically kind of moving closer together and then separating. And I think one of the things that was interesting about the show that you were recently in, um, Theodora, the Rituals of Rented Island at the Whitney, was that it was, uh, it was one of the first times that a museum actually brought together theater people and um, people mm. from the visual yeah, arts world. that's true in terms of the yeah. making of a history of performance. Mm -hmm. And that's a big theme that I've been very interested in for quite a long time now. And I think the confusion comes from how we use the term performance and performance art and theater. And because the, there is another question now that performance art is thought to be moving closer and closer to theater. Um, in, it is. In recent I, years, especially I so with too. what we yeah. see in New York. So it's a really complicated a yeah, fascinating issue that we actually have two histories of performance, one mm -hmm. from the visual arts and one from theater. Mm -hmm. The question is how do we bring them together mm -hmm. for, for, a, for a larger, more comprehensive view? Thank you. <laughs> um, I'd, I'd also like to hear Judith Molina on the subject that you were just talking yeah. about and speaking yeah. about ah, yeah. uh, th both the divisions between the arts, particularly the performance art and theater, but also the visual arts, uh, the divisions, how she sees the divisions and how the living theater embodied, embodied and embodies in the present tense uh, a coming together of, of some of those disciplines. Jason, could you actually the question was, yes. how did the living theater um, embody and embrace the differences between performance art and live theater? Uh, it's a very interesting question. Uh, in fact, it's a, it's a deep concern of everyone in the living theater uh, in terms of uh, what are we saying and how are we saying it? Uh, which is basically the, uh, uh, the foundation of all interesting theater work. I certainly found it in uh, Theodora's uh, use of UNESCO. Uh, I find it in many, in many good works. Uh, wherever there is a, uh, an ensemble and a director, who is working on ideas. And my problem with UNESCO, and it's not my problem with UNESCO as uh, Theodora interprets it, <laughs> because I think that's just what should be done uh, with a play of that sort. Uh, that is that I think that UNESCO is a wit, is a brilliant, uh, expressive, uh, witty, intelligent uh, writer. On the other hand, I fault him for not taking this into an activist position where each person hearing the play has to come to some conclusion within his or herself mm -hmm. about what this means to him or to her. And that's a very personal thing, and it will differ. It will differ from a spectator to spectator, and it will differ from company to company, and from the interpretation of the work. What I admire about what uh, Theodora does is that she does give an underlying political voice 
to the chairs. <laughs> Instead of the chairs being inanimate objects, which uh, in, in, in UNESCO, as I understand it, can really never be filled. In, in Theodora's uh, interpretation, they are fulfilled. And they're fulfilled by the speeches of the past and uh, uh, the aspirations of the present. <laughs> Uh, that is us, the spectator <laughs> participant, uh, who has to in some way make an interpretation out of the director's interpretation of the playwright's interpretation. <laughs> and in, I don't agree with the UNESCO's interpretation of the scene, <laughs> but I do, I do agree very strongly uh, uh, with uh, Theodora Skipitaris' interpretation. Thank you, Judith. <laughs> we could leave it right there. Yeah. That was pretty great. We could. Uh, yeah, I had a question, Theodore. Um, do you believe that art in general, not just theater or performance art, should be political? And then what do you, because I, I so growing up in Greece, I, I remember being taught art art for the sake of art being completely dismissed and, and students from even as young as eight, 15, 16, like in high school, being pushed um, to make art that, that is very political. And that, that you know, that it, it, that's how it should be. Um, and then that kind of carries on for like young artists in their 20s and 30s also kind of make art um, in that mindset. So I don't know, I was wondering if you... Well, what you I, I just want to, I, I can't answer such a big sweeping statement, but I can just say that in spite of myself, I always want to make puppets that have an agenda or have a message. <laughs> and a lot of people don't like my work because of that. And um, sometimes some people feel I overburden my puppet works with, with, you know, with language, which can be a real problem sometimes, just literalness, you know. So, Yes, for me, I'm always interested in work that has a message or that has a political aspiration. And by the way, I think we're in the middle of a phase right now, especially in the visual arts, where there are some really great artists who are doing social practice art that is just thrilling and really expansive and really great. Mm -hmm. So we're lucky we're in that period again. I think we are. Okay. Or maybe not. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank thank you. you very much. <laughs> thank you. That was so All much right. fun. Really quickly, just want to thank one more time both the legendary artists here Martha Wilson. Yay! And Theodora. And Theodora Skipitaris. And of, course, and of course, Judith Molina as well for her participation. We would be thrilled if you would all join us uh, around the corner at the Archive Bar. We're going to be having a little reception uh, at the Archive Bar. It's on 35th, I believe. The, the address is on your programs. I'm sorry, I don't have it in front of me. But um, we'll be... We'll be moving th that way for some drinks and, and to toast to Theodora. So thank you very much. 36. Sorry.